Welcome back to part two of our lecture on structural design thinking as part of the overall architectural design process. We have been talking about predominantly tension structures or tensile structures. But in particular, we've been talking about how tensile elements, which we think of as the predominant elements within the structure, are actually facilitated by other equally crucial elements. When we look at Dorton Arena, shown here, we think of the cable network roof as the spectacular and innovative part of the design, and we refer to it as a tensile structure. However, the cable network spanning the space is supported both vertically and horizontally by the arches acting in compression. The arches made the, make the cable network possible. In the case of the Federal Reserve Bank, the suspension structure is supported by compression in the towers. They support the ends of the suspension elements against the force of gravity and in compression in the truss across the top, which provides the horizontal force to keep the suspension elements from pulling the tops of the towers inward. In the case of the Seattle-Tacoma Airport, the cable wall is made possible by compression action in the columns and by bending action in the cantilevers reaching out to support the cables at the top. That summarizes our discussion of what we are calling predominantly tensile structures, or which we sometimes briefly or more briefly refer to as tensile structures. Now we'd like to talk about predominantly compression systems. The classic example of this would be an arch with supports at each end. In order for the arch to act in pure compression as intended, the support forces at the end must be directed tangential to the center line of the arch. We can break these support forces down into vertical and horizontal components. The vertical force at each support is equal to half the total gravity force on the arch. The horizontal force is whatever it has to be to make the overall force along the center line of the arch, or in other words, tangential to the direction of the arch. The horizontal force H is called the buttressing force. In this case, the buttressing forces are provided by the Rock Mountain. This is a bridge in Switzerland by Maillard, who was uh, an artist in the use of concrete in compression spanning structures. In the case of the Broadgate Exchange House, the buttressing force is provided by the tension member connecting arch base point to arch base point, which is shown right here. This is that tension member with the eye bolt connection providing the horizontal component to make the arch work. This is an underground portion of the Moscone Center in San Francisco. Steel cables under the floor were post-tensioned to pull the base points together to lift the concrete arches off of the formwork before removing the formwork. Sometimes where we need the most massive structure is also where we want access for human movement. This is an example by Pierre Luigi Nervi of how we can channel forces to open up architecture. So there's a whole series of arch elements in the roof. The forces of those are being gathered and transmitted down these narrow buttressing elements, which allows human beings to pass between them. So that completes our discussion of what we would call predominantly compression structures, which we note are partially sustained in many cases by tension members or tie members at the base of the compression members. Sometimes we have structures that are sort of balanced between tension and compression elements. Um, an example of that would be trusses. This is the International Terminal in San Francisco Airport, which was designed by Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. The boat-shaped trusses at the center of the structure 
are supported at each end. That would be right here and right here by the tips of these cantilevered trusses, which are cantilevering off of the column. The top cords of the bow trusses would be in compression. That would be these members here. And the bottom cord is in tension under gravity load. The top cords of the cantilever trusses are in tension and the bottom cords are in compression under gra gravity load. These tension members, which were attached at the top of the column, come down and acting in, in tension support this point, which supports this compression strut, which supports this tension element, which supports that compression strut, and so forth. The tension and compression action of these elements is expressed by the cross-sectional shape of the elements with tension occurring in the slender rods and compression in the vertical tubular elements. Some elements that would be in tension under gravity loads go into compression under wind loads or wind suction if the wind suction is severe enough. In that case we render these elements as tubes rather than rods to express the more challenging loading condition of compression where elastic instability controls the distribution of material and the cross-section of the element. So, for example, in these boat-shaped elements, the tension members at the raw, at the bottom, are also rendered as tubes because under wind suction, the roof will suck upwards and those bottom cords will go into compression. These planar trusses, right here, are inherently laterally unstable and they are restrained by a whole series of bracing elements that force them to stay in a vertical plane. On the other hand, these boat trusses consist of two sloped truss elements that intersect at the bottom cord and they brace each other so I sometimes refer to them as mutually braced trusses or self-braced trusses. Self-braced trusses don't just occur in boat shapes. The more conventional parallel cord trusses can be sloped. So here on this side we have a planar truss. On this side we have a planar truss. And they are connected together at the bottom so that they are mutually braced. In addition to trusses, we want to talk about bending elements. We sometimes say the simplest example of this is a simple beam with a parallel top flange and a parallel bottom flange. Um, axial tension tends to be the most efficient structural action, followed by axial compression and then bending. So normally for long spans and really challenging structural situations, we try to use tension or tension and compression structures. However, in many situations, the spans are small and the bending elements are the most practical way to get the job done in a simple economical manner. This plywood decking is acting in bending. It's spanning between the wood joist. It's wide and shallow which is not the most structurally efficient configuration. However, the plywood was originally intended to provide enclosure of the envelope, and it is only spanning a very short distance. So structural efficiency is not particularly crucial. So we make it wide enough to create enclosure and thick enough to span. Um, and even though it's not the most structurally efficient form, it works fine because in this case it's only spanning 24 inches. When longer spans are involved, we improve the leverage by setting these beams up edgewise. In other words, we don't lay them down flat like the plywood. We set them up on edge. 
These uh, joists or beams are also in bending, but they are configured to be deep and narrow, which is a more structurally efficient way in which to configure the material as opposed to wide and shallow, which is the case with plywood. This is a foam rubber element that is useful in demonstrating the phenomenon of buckling. When it is relaxed, lying on the tabletop, we draw a red line down the center line between top and bottom. And then we draw two vertical black lines, which are parallel to each other initially. When we lift up the rubber beam and support it at each end, it develops a dramatic curvature, which is made possible by the fact that it's foam rubber and therefore very elastic. All beams develop this curvature under bending force. The effect is just more dramatic in this particular beam in order to help us visualize the phenomenon. The following experimental observations are made. The red line curves dramatically, but the red length of the red line does not change. We call it the neutral axis for this and for some other reasons we'll touch on in a moment. The black lines remain stra straight, but they tilt dramatically. They are no longer vertical and they are no longer parallel to each other. The tilting black lines indicate that the material at the top of the beam is shortening and the material at the bottom of the beam is elongating. We know that has to be true because we measured the red line and discovered it did not change in length. And when we measure the top surface, we see it has shortened and the bottom surface of the beam has elongated. The fact that these lines are straight indicates that the degree of shortening of the material above the neutral axis is in direct proportion to how far above the material how far the material is above the neutral axis. And also the degree of lengthening of the material below the neutral axis is in direct proportion to how far the material is below the neutral axis. Over the operating range of most structural materials, the degree of shortening or lengthening of the material is in direct proportion to the stress, i.e. the force per unit area, causing the shortening or lengthening, as shown in the following image. Here you see the bending stress on an interior face of this beam. We don't actually, we're not actually able to see the stress arrows, but we're able to deduce them from the previous arguments. The maximum compression stress in pounds per square inch or, or thousands of pounds per square inch is at the top of the beam. The maximum tension stress is at the bottom of the beam and the stress varies linearly between the top and the bottom reaching zero at the center of the beam. Hence reinforcing the expression neutral axis. This combination of tension and compression stress is referred to as the bending stress. Some common modes of failure for, for bending are shown in this diagram. Tearing of the material in tension on the bottom of the beam or crushing of the material on the top of the beam, which is a strength and safety issue. On the right is shown the issue of deflection or stiffness. Too much deflection can be a perceptual issue for the building occupants when they sense vibration or disturbing movement of the floor. They'll be distracted at the very least or possibly even concerned about their safety. It also can become an actual safety issue, such as roof failure due to a phenomenon called ponding on a flat roof. The rains cause roof deflection, which causes a pond of water to occur, which, is incre which increases the load, which causes further deflection, leading to further ponding and eventually uh, the failure of the roof. This is an actual safety issue 
even though it started off as purely a deflection issue. The issue of movement of the floor is a perceptual issue, as I mentioned. It's not necessarily a safety issue. For example, we've all had the experience of standing on a diving board and bouncing up and down, and we don't doubt for a moment that it's strong enough to support us, but we know it moves a lot. When people experience that phenomenon in a building, they become concerned that it's a safety issue. It's at the very least a distraction. So we have certain rules about how far we will let a, def a beam deflect under the live load of people on the beam. There's a third mode of failure that we need to be concerned about, which is elastic instability. Narrow beams can buckle to the side or beams with thin elements, such as thin flanges and webs, may also exist, uh, exhibit uh, elastic instability in local parts of the beam, which of course leads to other parts of the beam failing. So here we have some photographs of a few simple experiments. This shows a styrene sheet of material laid flat to produce a wide and very shallow beam. This beam is so shallow and so lacking in stiffness that it actually fails catastrophically by extreme deflection, leading to it falling down between its supports. This would be an example of failure due to lack of stiffness. The next several images will show the same piece of styrene sheet in various configurations. If we set the sheet of material up edgewise, it becomes stiffer. Managing to support itself in even a small amount of weight at the center. However, this beam supports very little load before the compression material at the top of the beam becomes unstable and begins to buckle to the side. We sometimes call this phenomenon lateral instability, and we regularly use the term buckling to refer to it. We can fix this problem by reconfiguring the material in the styrene sheet by cutting it into three narrow sheets and gluing them together into an eye section. This new cross section has a horizontal sheet on top called the top flange, a horizontal sheet on the bottom called the bottom flange, and a vertical sheet connecting the top and bottom flanges, which we call the web. The section of this eye beam is not as stiff as the vertical sheet of material, but it is much stronger and can hold more weight because it is not so vulnerable to lateral instability. If we want to, we can be very sophisticated in man manipulating the cross-section of a beam to best address the stress distribution and stability issues, as shown in this beam, where the top flange is made widest at the center, addressing both the force acting at the center and the issue of lateral stability. We can also change the depth of the beam along the length giving it greater lever arm or greater depth where the moment is the greatest. In the case of these glass mullion beams backing up this wall, they are spanning from top to bottom, and we want to make them deep near the center of the span and shallower near the top and bottom, which are the support points against the horizontal force. This is another example of that treatment. The V-shaped beams are made from steel plate welded together. Cutting the plates at an angle is easily handled on the shears that are used in this manufacturing technology. This is another example of adjusting the depth of the beam, in this case making it deeper at the base of the cantilevered beams. The elements supporting the suspension roof in this building serve both in compression and bending under the forces exerted by the roof cables, which exert a component of force parallel to the support element, inducing axial compression, and a component of force perpendicular to the supporting elements, inducing bending in the supporting elements. 
the supporting elements are made have been made wide at the base to increase the lever arm for resisting the bending induced by the perpendicular component of the cable force. The structural core of the Burj Khalifa serves both in axial compression under gravity loads and in bending under wind and seismic forces. The structural core is a beam, the cross section of which projects in all three directions. It goes this way, this way, and that way. These are the flanges of the beam. These are the web members of the beam. This is the core that prevents lateral torsional buckling, or in other words, pinwheel failure of these buttressing elements or web elements. This concrete structure also provides excellent fireproofing for people moving through these corridors and moving vertically in this core. The vertical towers at the end of this building serve both in axial compression under gravity loads and in bending under wind and seismic forces. Wind force on the glass on this broad face is carried by the beam action of the glass off to the mullions. The mullions span from floor to floor and the force of those mullions is absorbed by the floor edge. The horizontal floor elements are basically beams that carry those forces off to the towers on each end. You'll notice a huge eye section that's built in to the towers at the ends, which allows those towers to function as beams to carry those forces down to the foundation. Post and beam construction is a classical form of construction using wood beams and columns to resist gravity forces. The system is very poor, poor in resisting horizontal forces of wind and seismic due to the lack of good methods for connecting wood elements together. Armed with modern welding, steel beams can connect, be connected together to produce excellent joints, as shown here. These frames, which are very thick or deep and strong at the joints, are very effective at resisting horizontal forces of wind and seismic. In fact, the joints are so strong, they are also very effective in resisting gravity forces by having the horizontal spanning elements cantilevering off of the vertical elements. In other words, this structural system works really well for both horizontal and vertical forces. This is a close-up image of, the, of a frame similar to the one in the previous slide. This image includes excellent examples of axial tension, axial compression, and bending action. So, for example, for a wind load that induces compression in this direction, in this member, it exerts a force at the end of this member, and this member must then work in compression to resist that force. To avoid lateral instability or buckling, this member has been made relatively thick in all directions. When it arrives at this point, it induces tension into this member, and that member is rendered as a very slender rod because it's never intended that it's going to work in any manner except as in tension. Finally, wind parallel to the frames, these elements here, induces bending action in the frames, which are made very thick in the appropriate direction. In other words, parallel to the direction of the force. We can reshape uh, this concept of the frame for buildings with 
long span compared to height, in which the gravity effects substantially outweigh the wind effects. This portion can be thought of as a tapered beam cantilevering off this vertical. This portion can be thought of as a tapered beam cantilevering off of this portion. This portion can be thought of as a simple span, which supported on one end on the tip of this cantilever and on the other end on the tip of this cantilever. The cantilever beams on each side have been made deeper at the supports to address the need for greater bending strength at those locations. Here and here. And the simple span beam in the middle going from here to here has been made deeper at its center to address the need for greater bending strength at that location. So now we have covered axial tension action, axial compression action, and bending action. And now we'd like to talk about how we can conceptualize a structural system for a modern building. Modern building materials tend to have high stress capacity and are very structurally efficient. This means that they can often achieve the intended primary structural function in very thin sheets. For example, plywood or sheet metal. On the other hand, while thin sheets tend to be strong for forces in some directions, they are also weak and vulnerable to elastic instability in other directions. We can compensate for this weakness by con connecting thin sheets of structural material together in mutually bracing configurations. I call this design conceptualization, conceptualization process finding opportunities for mutually bracing sheets of material. We already talked about this thin sheet of material turned up on edge, which is stiff and strong vertically and very weak horizontally. We reconfigured the material as three mutually bracing sheets of material and got a much more satisfactory performance. The modern wide flange I-beam shown here is a classic example of mutually braced sheets of material. In this case, a top flange, a bottom flange, and the web member, which braces both the top flange and the bottom flange, and which in turn is braced itself by the top flange and the bottom flange. Corrugated steel decking is another example of many, many interacting, intersecting sheets of material. So all of these sheets that are more or less vertical brace the horizontal sheets at their line of intersection. The diaphragm floor and diaphragm roof of this structure represent thin sheets of material that are very strong against horizontal forces but weak against vertical forces. While we do not think of the trusses as sheets of material because they are visually more transparent than opaque, they are in fact lights of sheets of material that are deep and strong in the vertical direction and thin and weak in the horizontal direction. Connecting these trusses that are deep and strong in the vertical direction to the floor and roof which are deep and strong in the horizontal direction makes a tubular structure that is strong against forces in all directions. Similar arguments apply to this structure. The triangular trusses on the side are deep and strong in the vertical direction. The moment frames with rigid welded joints on the top and bottom of the structure are deep and strong in the horizontal direction. When connected together, these sheets of material form a tube that is strong against forces in all directions. We have applied the concept of mutually braced sheets of material at the small scale, that is, at beams and corrugated deckings, decking, and in larger scale elements like pedestrian bridges. We can also apply it at the larger scale of entire buildings, even very large buildings.
To start that thought process off, we're going to start with something simple and familiar. Here are some 2x4 studs nailed together in the conventional manner. These joints are very weak, as demonstrated here, where this person is pushing the structure over with a single finger. When we add a sheet of oriented strand board or plywood, the structure becomes extremely strong, resisting the maximum force that the person can apply. When we consider a thin wall on a narrow foundation that's suited for resisting gravity force, a tiny force can blow the wall over. In fact, in some cases, the wall will be unstable and requires no wind force at all for the wall to collapse over. The number one killer of construction workers is the collapse of unbraced walls. The people who do construction work don't fully understand this concept and do not plan for it appropriately. Connecting that wall to two other walls at the corner makes it much stronger. It is still force vulnerable to deformation and failure to forces far removed from the braced corners. That problem can be cured by connecting a diaphragm roof to the tops of all the walls creating more mutually braced sheets of material. So this box becomes an extremely stable example of many mutually braced sheets of material, which you can model yourself out of chipboard and become progressively impressed that the structure becomes better and better as more and more mutually braced sheets are added. Corrugated roofing can be very strong as a sheet of material resisting force parallel to the corrugations. Corrugated decking tends to be weaker in the other direction where the corrugations tend to behave somewhat like an accordion, especially in the corrugations close to the edge where the force is applied. However, this problem is always, almost always mitigated by the compression action of the beams or trusses that support the roof deck. Welding the deck at every flute to the supporting spanning members not only keeps the deck from lift, lifting off and kiting away under wind suction on the roof, it also assures that forces along the edge of the roof are distributed through all the corrugations in the roof, thereby avoiding the accordion effect. Sometimes the sheets of material are not planar. Up till now we've been talking about planar sheets of material or at least trusses that are almost planar. This parallel vault tends to be fairly strong and stiff against forces parallel to the axis of the vault, but weak against forces perpendicular to the structure. We can duplicate this barrel vault, rotate it 90 degrees, and intersect it with the original vault. When we do that, the two intersecting vaults become mutually bracing. This mutually bracing effect is so powerful that we can then remove all the barrel vault material occurring underneath each of the vaults to produce a form we call a cross vault or groin vault, which is very strong against both gravity forces and wind forces in all directions. This structural concept led to all the great Romanesque and, Catholic and Gothic cathedrals. So this is an example of the, the sheets of material that are intersecting in a way where they're mutually bracing, even though, even though those materials have curvature and are not flat sheets. We can carry that thought process a step further and look at a structure with double curvature. We can imagine a dome as made of mutually braced sheets of material. 
Here the dome is performing well in resisting the horizontal force of the hand in this direction. Removing the side portions of the dome leaves a structure resembling an arch. That arch is relatively very weak in resisting horizontal force of the hand now. So we can think of these pieces as the shear walls. And this is the wall that's taking the frontal pressure of the wind. We don't normally think of a shear wall as being curved this way. We don't think of the wall that's resisting the wind as having this shape. But in fact, when we knit these things together, they're actually behaving extremely well in resisting that horizontal force. We can use mutually braced sheets of material in huge structures. This is the John Hancock building in Chicago. It uses huge trusses on the faces of the building as mutually braced sheets of material. In other words, there's a huge truss on each of the four faces. They are connected together at the corners. They are also not the only mutually bracing material. Every single floor diaphragm connects into that structure and helps to stiffen that truss structure. And likewise, the truss structure tends to help, or at least the columns in those exterior walls tend to support the floor diaphragms and help keep them stable. It should be pointed out in the name of honesty that since this is in Chicago where it gets very cold, you are not actually looking at the structure of the building. The pattern you see on the facade is cladding that mimics the structure inside the building. This allows you to see generally how the building is behaving structurally, but allows for a good insulated layer behind the cladding. This is the city court building in New York, which was raised up off the ground plane at the corners to make room for the church which is right here, which owned that piece of property first. And for public spaces on this corner and these public malls on the other corners. This is the public space at the street intersection, which brings in extra light and provides extra space right at the point where it is most needed in the city fabric. As dramatic and as unusual as this building appears, its structure is based on all the same principles that we have been discussing up till now. As shown in these diagram, diaphragms, sketched by the structural engineer, whose name was William LeMessure, in a meeting with the architect. Trusses on the facade are connected together at the corners. Floor diaphragms provide other sheets of mutually bracing material. The only unusual thing is that the trusses on the facades collect the forces together and deliver to them to the large columns at the centers of the external wall, thereby allowing for the cantilever of the structure at the corners. This shows the general kind of deformation in the floors and columns under horizontal force. To reduce this deformation and make the structure stronger under horizontal forces, we can make the floor and columns deeper and moment connect them at the corners. So here we have a floor beam, we have a thickening of the columns, we connect them together with a moment connection, and this produces what we call a moment frame or rigid frame. And under the horizontal force, it's behaving much better than the structure with these slender elements. We can take this simple concept and make a very tall building. An example of a moment frame structure is the Sears Tower, designed by Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. For decades, it was the tallest building in the world. The welded connections where the beams and columns meet 
here and here, for example. Where those beams and columns intersect, the joints are full penetration welds that makes it impossible to know whether the beams or the columns, in other words, the horizontal elements or the vertical elements, were originally continuous through the joint. This is the raw steel frame. This is how it looks in the lobby space after the structure has been clad in decorative polished stainless steel. This building has no triangulation and no shear walls inside it. Its lateral stability is provided totally by this rigid frame. And if you ever get a chance to go visit the building, you will find huge windows in these openings. So even though it's considered rigid frame and the elements are considered really thick and super strong, um, it actually is an incredibly beautiful daylight building with marvelous views out through the windows. We showed these examples previously of pure torsion action. We said that the closed tube shown at the top here, the square tube, is much better than any of the shapes in resisting torsion. A round tube would be slightly better in torsion even than the square tube. However, we didn't show that here because we could not figure out how to make this particular material into a round tube without altering the nature of the plastic material with which we started. So it would not have yielded a valid comparison. But we can demonstrate mathematically that a round tube would work slightly better than the square tube. While we cannot curve this particular plastic into a round tube without altering the fundamental properties of the plastic, we can, in steel, manufacture round tubes very effectively. The curved bridge in this structure, shown up here and less clearly down below, is acting in both bending and torsion. The bending comes from spanning between support points. The torsion is occurring because the loads are off the center line between the supports. This is because the bridge is curving out from the center line, away from the center line between the supports. So that the loads of the bridge are tending to make the support beam underneath, the tubular support beam twist. This twisting action can be further exaggerated if all the people decide to stand on the outer edge of this bridge, which will induce much more of the twisting action. To address both torsion and bending, the round tubular steel beam was chosen. This is what that looks like from down below, going from this support point to that support point. In a similar situation, this curved beam is addressing bending with a wide top flange and a wide bottom flange and is addressing torsion by the creation of this tubular part of the cross section. That ends our lecture on structures as a part of the overall architectural design process.